what I'm going to talk about today. So it's really a, a, little, a, a little grab bag of things that I wanted to talk about. Um, first of all, for those of you who may, I will do a very quick overview of the Sanger Institute. I suspect actually most of you know exactly who we are already, but I'll do that anyway. Um, I'll talk a bit about how our data flow works today. Um, some fairly detailed stuff about how we're you, what are we doing with IRODs to do our data management. Um, a cautionary sort of tale really about um, genomics versus luster, and it really was a bit of a case of versus luster for a while. Um, and then, as George mentioned, I'll be talking about some of the challenges um, about uh, the clinical stuff that we're that we're trying to get to. And if the time, if I still have time at the end, I'll also talk about EMED Lab. Uh, does anybody has anybody heard of EMED Lab on this side of the pond? No. I have. Oh, you have. <laughs> okay, right. Well, yeah, George should know about it. And okay, so EMED Lab is an interesting uh, collaborative um, genomics and uh, life sciences. Um, project that's currently taking place in uh, a data center just outside London in which Sanger is involved. So, <coughs> so the Sanger Institute, um, a uh, rather pretty building on an extremely uh, uncharacteristically sunny day for England. So what do we do? Um, we have a number, we're funded by the Wellcome Trust, which as many of you will know is the world's second biggest medical charity. Um, we have uh, six or so um, scientific programs, um, but they all come down to largely doing the same thing, which is the analysis of variation information um, and, its, and its links to disease and treatments and, and so on and so forth. So you can see the main scientific areas there, um, mouse and zebrafish, cancer, human genetics, infection genomics, what we used to call the pathogen group, um, cellular genetics, and then all of the computational stuff um, that goes with it. Uh, we work on a five-year funding cycle, um, and the current cycle ends in 2016. Um, some of you are probably uh, well aware of some of the tools that we've developed, particularly in the computational genomics group. So, for example, we're the current principal maintainers of SAM tools, um, as far as NGS workloads are concerned. And that particular uh, program is heavily involved in the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health uh, which I know some of you in this room are also involved in. So underpinning those, uh, we have a number of core facilities that the, that the Institute maintains. Um, we have a centralized DNA sequencing facility for, for all of the scientific programs. And in parallel with those, we also have uh, these model organism and uh, what we call CGAP, cellular generation and phenotyping. So the model organisms program uh, and the and CGAP both produce um, biological experimental systems. You know, in one case, mouse or zebra, zebrafish, and in the other case, uh, induced pluripotent stem cells uh, with targeted mutations um, that the scientists may wish to um, to examine once they've uh, found some gene of interest to them. And obviously, we have a, a central IT facility that underpin, that underpins all of that, which is what I'm involved in. So hopefully our data flow looks some, I would hope this is reasonably familiar to anybody who does this sort of work. Um, the data from the sequencer is initially um, captured on a, some sort of staging storage. We do some QC and reference genome alignment, all that sort of stuff. After that, we store the data in IRODs. It's automatically tagged with the metadata of what the instrument was, what the experiment was, who it was for, et cetera, et cetera. And that's, that left-hand side of that diagram is what I would refer to as primary analysis. It's a complete, pretty much completely automated setup. There's very little manual, in, manual work going on there at all. The right-hand side of that diagram is what the scientist then does with that data. So that's what I would think of as secondary analysis. And so that involves staging the data out of IRODs onto uh, Lustre parallel file systems, performing whatever kind of um, variation analysis or whatever it is that they're doing, and finally publishing that data either back into some sort of archival storage. Some people put it back in IRODs. Some people put it on, a web, on the website through a relational database. There's a myriad of different ways. So how does the uh, left-hand side of this actually look today, the way we currently do this? It's a pretty simple scale-out architecture. We initially tried to do this using 
uh, using shared storage and actually realized that that just made things more complicated, less reliable, and wasn't necessary. So these days, what we have is a, each sequencer has a dedicated server with about 50 terabytes of direct attached block storage to it. And it runs Samba so that the sequencer can upload its data to it. And there's, as I say, there's one of those for each sequencer. Um, they can, the sequences can be retargeted if the, ser if the server fails. Um, and currently, we sequence around two terabytes of data a day. Then there's a, on the right-hand side of this diagram, which unfortunately we can't quite see because of this annoying cutoff, but there we go. Uh, there's a thousand, um, there's a thousand core cluster which um, just uses straightforward NFS to read the data off that, off those uh, staging servers and perform that primary analysis, the QA, the, re the reference alignment and all of that stuff. Um, and when that is all completed, the aligned BAM files and CRAM files are stored in IRODs. Actually, as of this morning, that is now out of date because th they've just made the announcement that the sequencing facility is no longer going to be producing BAM files. They're, gonna, they're switching in, uh, wholesale to CRAM from now on. So um, one of the things we're thinking about doing is actually simplifying that even further. Um, we're quite interested in, in using um, these sort of new, well, they're not that new. I, mean, so I guess Sun started things with the, um, 40, the, with the Thumper type machine in the, in the, a few years ago. But we're interested in using just dedicated storage servers and actually combining the compute with the, with the storage. So that's one thing that we are considering doing. Um, initially, just as a replacement for that single server and, and direct attached storage, um, but still maintaining the same software stack we do today. Uh, but afterwards, we're quite keen on actually this idea of running the compute directly on it and eliminating that thousand node cluster altogether if we can. Um, that is a, 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 pr a process that we're going to attempt this year. Uh, it's, not, it's not something we've actually got in production yet, but it's, that's the direction we're thinking of going. So for the next step, we talk about you know, the, where the data goes into IRODs. Now, I is everybody here reasonably familiar with what IRODs is? Who isn't? Nobody. Excellent. Right. Good. <laughs> so I don't need to explain what IRODs is. But so I can just talk about the way we architect it. So <coughs> um, we have multiple federated zones, um, which uh, for, for different scientific purposes, uh, that allows us to have a single common authentication across the whole, the whole shooting match. Um, and the individual users can choose for a particular scientific area which particular uh, set of rules they want. It's entirely up to them. So, for example, you can see um, the, the, uh, the one on the left there, the sequencing. Um, that's the sequencing zone, which is by far the largest. Um, but we also have this archival zone and a human genetics zone, and the one that you can't see on the right is the one specifically for the UK 10K project. <coughs> One of the is interesting um, issue things that we do here is, is that we deliberately allow all of the um, different scientific users to have whatever, whatever rules they need in their zone um, for their own particular needs. So some people have particular kinds of data integrity checks. Some people don't want to rely on IRODs doing the data integrity, and they want to do it themselves in their application. That's fine. Um, um, and actually, I think that's quite a critical thing. I, Relying on just IRODs to do the uh, data integrity checking is probably not ideal. Uh, we have, I was talking earlier about a, a data corruption issue we had that was due to, um, actually due to a BIOS interaction in some of the HP blades we were using. Um, technical details aren't terribly important, but we were getting random data corruption occasionally. And the only reason we spotted it was because the sequencing guys were rigorously checking their, che checking their data integrity, and, um, both in, in and out of IRODs. It wasn't actually an IRODs' fault at all, but that was where they noticed it. We do deliberately keep the rules very light. We don't, we don't use IRODs to actually manage our data flow as such. We use it for replication. We use it for checksumming and this sort of thing. But we, tr we do try, having been bitten in the past by getting locked into particular technologies and then finding you're in a dead end, 
we try not to allow ourselves to get locked into any particular technology. So that's one of the reasons we keep the rules quite light and do the, the real data flow management outside. So what does the physical architecture look like? Well, today we use predominantly DDN SFA 10Ks, um, underlying iRODs. There is a bit of other vendors' storage. I won't say who, given who the sponsors today are. Um, we use Oracle Rack for, cut for holding the, the metadata, and uh, we just have two active active resource servers in two different rooms of our data center. Our data center is divided into four quadrants, which have an eight-hour firewall between them. So hopefully, if the, if the uh, building catches fire, only one quadrant will burn down at a time. Um, and we have the whole thing set up into a, divided into a series of, of 43 terabyte uh, volumes uh, from each of the um, from each of the sequencing uh, from each of the SFAs, and that's basically it. So there are some issues with with that. The first one is, like I said, the, both copies are still on site. Um, there, it is uh, conceivable that there could be an accident that would uh, that would take out both the entire data center. Um, and we only have two iRes servers per zone. Um, that means a pretty large failure domain if the iRes server goes away. Um, plus, uh, despite the efforts of our good friends here, large RAID arrays are still expensive. This is not a particularly cheap way of doing this. Um, and we have large numbers of sizable POSIX file systems, which are a bit of a pain to, to manage. So here's, what, here's just as a little aside why we have a a particular issue here. This is a, an aerial photograph, courtesy of Google, of, of the area where we are. You can see I've, I've pointed out where Sanger's data center is. It's that little blue, it's, it is that blue building just there. Now, I don't know whether you can read it, but here, that says Imperial War Museum. And there's a nice airfield here, nice runway. And the aircraft, it's an active airfield, and the aircraft do a nice sort of left-hand circuit, and they come round, and they use our data center as an aiming point, and then they come round, and they, <laughs> and they land again. And you know, they're not, they're not uh, nice modern airplanes. They're beautiful things like this. Um, and that's lovely, and we get, to, we get to sit outside and have our tea and watch these beautiful aircraft doing their stuff. And then with somewhat monotonous regularity, they fall out of the sky. <laughs> Um, and those, um, that's three accidents that happened in just one year. So um, we did get, we, are, we have been getting steadily more alarmed at the rate at which these things are, are falling out of the sky. And so we th thought, well, we really ought to actually do something about it. So this is, this is the direction we're going in. So we've got our two existing two and a half petabytes in each data, in each quadrant um, sets of, of data. And we're building a, th a third one. Um, but we're using a different architecture. Um, we decided on this occasion to use that same sort of uh, standardized just compute node, <coughs> compute node with a lot of disks in it, and a lot of them. So there are going to be 30 of these storage servers, um, each one running iRes locally. Um, and there'll be, a, there'll be a backup iRod server just as a virtual machine and a backup uh, Oracle database. We're going to copy all of the data across here. I have cheesy little animation. Um, copy all the data across to it so that we briefly have three copies of the data. Um, you'll notice that this is five, pe five petabytes. That should give us, by the time we finish this entire um, process, we'll have 10 petabytes of iROS storage, which is enough, we think, to last us for about somewhere between one to two years, depending on the extent to which we use RX-10, um, which is largely a matter of money, as any of you with an X-10 will probably know. So um, once we've copied all of that data, it's a simple case of stick it in a van, and it gets driven down to our new data center. I apologize for my cheesy little animation there as well. Now. That's all very well. So this is, this is a new data center called the Janet Shared Data Center. It's um, a collaboration between the Joint Academic Network and uh, various universities in, Lon in London, UCL, uh, the Crick Institute, and various others. And we've chosen this particular site after a very long and tortuous um, procurement process. Um, 
And there are things that worry me about this. Any of you who've ever visited Sanger <laughs> and have had to drive this road, the M25, it is just about the busiest road in the UK. Yeah, why is it colored blue? It should be red. <laughs> well, no, no, there's the traffic bit. <laughs> this bit is always, midnight, huh? this bit's, oh yeah, that was, I think I did make this slide at about um, 10 o'clock at night. So yeah, it was only around Heathrow that it was. But yeah, so there, I just, there's the other problem. Yeah, we seem to have stuck it by another airport. Um, and quite a busy one, as any of you will, who've flown to London will know. But nevertheless, it's not actually in the flight path. So that was actually one of the uh, tender requirements. So I think we're, I think we're probably okay. So there's a summary of, of how we're doing that expansion and what the, what the key points of what we're trying to do are. Always keeping two copies live um, throughout the entire expansion. We're using these, starting to use these dedicated storage servers. Um, the nice thing about those stor dedicated storage servers is that they're basically normal Linux servers. We can manage them in exactly the same way we manage our compute nodes. It's a single platform that we do across the board, nice and easy. So we, you, we can manage them with CF Engine. We can do our automated installs that we currently do with, with our compute nodes, automated firmware updates, yada, yada, yada. It's all fine. It doesn't really solve the POSIX file system issue. We haven't got away from that yet. Um, but it does reduce the size of our failure domains. If an, if an individual one of those uh, resource servers now fails, we lose a fairly small amount of storage and not half of it. Um, and it, in theory, gives us higher bandwidth. Every single one of those iRes servers has got a 10 gigabit connection, and there are 30 of them. Now, as long as the data is well balanced, and that's a, okay, that's a fairly significant as long as, it should work quite well. At the moment, we're just using it as our DR copy off-site, so it's a, really just an experiment. And it looks as though it's going to be cost-effective, but we'll, it remains to be seen how reliable it's going to be. Um, we'll see. So what else, are we, what else are we doing? Well, iRods being an object store, we, often th we always thought that if you're using an iRods as an object store, wouldn't it make sense to use object storage underneath it instead of this complicated layer of traditional file systems and all that stuff. And so we've been looking at that uh, with DDN and also with, a, with some other vendors as well. Um, and most object stores have got S3 interfaces. And that's not really ideal. I mean, it, it, it works. You can, you, can make, uh, you can make iRods talk to it. And in the, you know, in, in this sort of, this is the case for a, any sort of object store or even for any, any form of file system storage that does its replication. You've effectively got some pool of storage that spans multiple sites. And you consider what happens when you put the data into iRods. So you take your BAM or your CRAM file and you stick it into iRods. And it ends up in the object store, at which point the storage system does something with it that usually makes it then appear as though it's in two places. And it's, in theory, it's available from here. The problem with having done that, just using with the standard S3 interface here, is that this iRes server over here has no, and the, and the iCAT database has no idea that that underlying replication happened. So, you know, at the, at the best, all that's going to happen is that when you ask iRods, I want to fetch my data, it's always going to direct you to this copy and never to this copy. Now, that's not, that's not brilliant, but, it's not, but that gets worse if you then have a hardware failure. And if your iRods, uh, iRods server goes wrong or your iRes server goes wrong, well, now, you could, in theory, fetch it from over here, but because iRods doesn't know about it, you can't. So what you need to do with your storage vendor is work with them to develop an iRods driver, which makes sure that this information gets back into iCAT so that iCAT can replicate it back over to the other side. And that's, the, that's one thing we're, we're currently working with uh, we have a, a proof of concept on WAS at the moment that we're, we're working with Dave and co to, to make work. So that's one future thing for our rods is doing, is doing object storage. Um, extending, our, um, extending our current architecture for, with all those federated zones, with separate zones for clinical sequencing, that's something that's actively happening now that the Institute has decided that even though we don't have a great deal of clinical science to do at the moment, it's a strategic thing they want us to do, so we're in the process. They have at least decided to do that before the big demand came along. So that's, that's good. It's not suddenly, oh, by the way, we have to do clinical sequencing next week. Um, 
we're going to switch to using authentication using PAM rather than Kerberos. Um, the main reason for that is that we want to get involved in a, in a federated authentication project within the UK called the Janet Moonshot, um, which is a bit like Shibboleth and, Sa and SAML type stuff, but it works for, everything, for, for things other than web, web services. So it's a general federated authentication and authorization mechanism, uh, about which a little bit more later. And we're also putting a lot of effort into making sure that we're monitoring, gra um, monitoring IRODs very effectively uh, using graphite. This has already helped us to know, uh, identify a number of interesting performance and, and other issues with IRODs that were otherwise very difficult to nail down. We had the usual sort of complaints from users, oh, you know, IRODs isn't going very well, it's, you know, the, the, the queries are taking a long time to come back. Um, and using uh, graphite and a frankly ridiculous number of metrics that we're now, that we're now measuring, um, it was very, uh, it was relatively, I don't want to say very, relatively easy to identify the problem and, and sort things out. So this is actually working, this is currently an experimental service, but we're going to turn this into a, uh, our standard monitoring service for IRODs from in the near future. And finally, we're going to start thinking about doing federation outside our own, inst our own institute. So a couple of things that are, are on the horizon here. <coughs> the EBI have now put a, um, an experimental IRODs layer on top of the EGA, um, which, we, which we haven't yet tried to link up to, but you know, given that they're just next door on the same campus, this should be a relatively, relatively straightforward thing for us to do. It's read-only. Um, we can't use it for submission to the EGA, but it's a good start. Um, and there's also this EMED lab project that I referred to. It's going to use IRODs as its data management layer, so there's a good, proper, there's a good possibility here. EGA. The European Genotype Archive. Genome f uh, so it's basically, it's the European um, large sequencing and f genotype repository, Sorry. EGA, ENA. <coughs> So, secondary analysis. What are we doing there? Um, not, a great, not a great deal, really. It's had, this hasn't changed much for a long time. So we've got our however many petabytes of IRODs it is. The number changes slightly in these slides because I've created them at different times. Um, people stage this stuff out to Lustre. We have around 14,000 cores of, of research um, clusters, uh, some dedicated to particular research projects, others not. Um, and we will... Uh, and the, they do that analysis against the stuff in Lustre, and then they copy that out into uh, NFS or a database or IRODs or wherever it eventually goes. The current architecture is largely, in fact, it's entirely based on various uh, generations of, of DDN exascalar hardware. We've got various sizes of file system. These days, we've been buying them at one petabyte a time. Um, most large projects within the institute have their own dedicated one so that they can't denial of service anybody else. Um, and we've got about six petabytes of total capacity. We do use the exascalar hardware and we buy exascalar support, but at the moment we don't use the exascalar actual luster product because until very soon now, it's not a recent, it's not a recent enough version of luster. So, um, we're use, currently rolling our own Lustre install on it. And our general aim is to deliver five megabytes per second per core of, of, of compute. We just use 10 gig Ethernet for the interconnect to the clients. We don't, we don't bother with any low latency interconnects out, outside the actual Lustre appliance itself. So where are we with Lustre and what are we planning to do with it? So we would really, really like to get to using Lustre appliances that are running 2.5 or later. We really want to get away from building our own luster stuff anymore. It takes too much time, um, and it's just, it just shouldn't be necessary. Um, we really want to have luster 2.5 for its HSM facilities. That's one of the critical points. Um, and we know that Exascalar and, and other luster appliances that other, other vendors are coming out with are going to support this version of luster quite soon, within the next few months. So this is looking pretty promising. We might be able to do it. We have ongoing issues between with clients and kernel versions. Um, it's very difficult to find a supported combination for some of the scientific needs. At the moment, if somebody wants uh, Lustre and Docker at the same time, especially if it's a recent version of Docker, 
we're sort of out of luck because Lustre needs, the current version of Lustre we're using needs 3.9 or less, and Docker needs 3.14 or greater. We lose. Um, so it's a bit, that's a bit tricky. Um, Docker, I'll mention later because it's, it com really comes in with our clinical issues. Um, one thing that has become abundantly clear is having vendor support has been absolutely critical throughout our, our work with Lustre. Um, it's, it's an open source product and you could, yeah, you could say, I'm going to do it all myself. <laughs> no, it doesn't really work like that. Um, we've had a number of issues with it, uh, which I'll come on to in the next slide, um, that, that really have required detailed work with DDN and with Intel to sort out. And one challenge we've got in the future is how do we deal with multi-tenanting on Lustre? Historically, it, the Institute really didn't care about security of one project from another. It was all, you know, we, we, we started out just doing the Human Genome Project and it was all getting shoveled out on the internet as fast as possible. Who cared, right? But now, of course, we've got people who are starting to want to do clinical sequencing and so on. And we have to start thinking, well, uh, we need to do this a bit more securely. So can we do multi-tenanting on Lustre? Because the users like Lustre and they don't really want to move away from it. Um, can we do it without just buying a separate Lustre appliance for every customer? We don't want to do that. That's going to be ludicrously expensive. So that's a, that's a challenge we've got. We're getting vendor support using you now. I mean, DDN have been nice enough to say, yeah, we will support you building your own luster on, on this kit. So, I mean, I'm sure they'd much rather we were using the <laughs> rolled, um, and we would rather we were using that as well. But until 2.5 is the supported uh, release, then. So here are two issues that we've currently, we've had with 2.5, uh, and it's just an example of how, D how work with DDN and Intel has really worked out for us. So we had a, a human genetics workload that was largely based on SAM tools, a lot of SAM tools stuff. We had an incident earlier this year where th we installed the 2.51 client on one small cluster, and it crashed every single one of our Lustre file systems, even the ones that the workload was not accessing. Um, and it turned out it was because it had all exhausted all the locks on every server. Um, so it, it, it took out all the Lustre file systems, which therefore DOSed every single cluster we had, um, which didn't make me, well, I wasn't very popular that day. Um, so we quickly identified that it was this human genetics cluster that was, um, that was causing it, so we took it uh, out, of the, out of the system. So we got everything back up. <coughs> and we also had that there were some severe performance issues with accessing the same file from multiple processes on a single node. So those are the two issues we've had, and I'll, go, I'll do, deal with them in some detail in a minute. So patches for both came from DDN um, and Intel working together. So here was, here was the, the, the performance issue we had. So if you do things right with Lustre and you, in, you use one megabyte read sizes and you pull data sensibly, you get nice performance. What's this? This is about 2.7 gigabytes a second. It's all very nice. If you do them in parallel, it's multiple threads reading the same file, like, oh, I don't know, a reference genome, perhaps, um, that fits in memory. So this, this, is, this potentially should just come out of memory cache. This shouldn't be a problem. Performance was terrible. 90% performance hit. If you do it with 4K reads, well, yeah, it's so, the performance is so slow, it's invisible. One megabyte a second. It's effectively stopped. So it took uh, quite a few months of work for, together with DDN and, um, <coughs> and Intel. In the meantime, we switched back to using NFS for serving the reference data sets because Lustre was basically not working. Um, but they came out with a, with a patch, which is this uh, 2.523 DDN test 15. Um, and you know, if you use it, if you use Lustre correctly, then it's all fine and it doesn't, you know, doesn't make any difference really. Um, but the performance improvement on the pathological cases is pretty good. Unfortunately, you can't, the really pathological case there, you can just about see it, it's up to about there. So, um, 
you know, up to about 600 megabytes a second. It's still not as good as, it, as, as the ideal case, but it's a great improvement on where we were. So that was pretty much a, a good success. Now that, that's using a pathological test case using just DD as the test. Those two patches put together, how did they work on that human genetics workload? Well, it's not bad. I mean, we got about a 20%, 20, 25% performance improvement as a result of those two patches. So in the, in the real world, in the real workload, it made, it made quite a big difference. So that was good. Do you remember what Sam Tools version that was? It would have been pre the one release. Um, exactly which version, I don't remember. I can find out. Uh, so clinical sequencing. So it's been decided by the Institute that we are going to do GCLP. They haven't asked us to do ISO certification yet, thank goodness. Um, I know that has led to a lot of new and, and increased processes that most people just weren't used to. You know, all these things that traditional research environments are really terrible at. You know, documenting stuff? Oh, that'll never catch on. Um, doing their project management properly, doing their change management properly, you know, all of these things. Validating a computer system? I'd never even heard of validating a computer system before I could, this came along. Um, identifying all your risks, all of this sort of thing. So this is, this is really alien stuff. So in order to, uh, to deliver a small-scale GCLP platform, uh, we sort of drew a, a high-level design of roughly how we thought we'd do it. So we've got a couple of high seq 2500 sequences set aside to do the GCLP lab process. We're still using the same staging server ar architecture that we currently were. No real reason to change that, we thought. And the same with our primary compute. We just set a couple of, a couple of dedicated machines aside. Not really a big deal. When we get down to how actually we're actually managing the data, so we're virtualizing everything where we can. Um, so now iRODS just becomes a, a, a virtual appliance within our VMware infrastructure. The LIMS database, which is, which is uh, GeneLogic's Clarity, uh, also will sit within, um, sit within that secure virtual machine zone. And it's a fairly small amount of data, so we can, we think, currently keep that as, a, as an entirely virtual prospect. Now, that was the theory. And the principles we were trying to follow, and I would be very interested from the people who I know are present who've done this on a, who are much further down this road than us, whether the, our principles are the, right, are the right sort of thing. So keep the hardware separate from the normal research uh, systems. That's for two reasons. Firstly, it's just a straightforward security reason. The second reason is that we want to limit the change management process leaking out into the research systems where we, don't, where we still want the flexibility and we don't want to force people to go through rigorous change management. We're going to be really seriously locking down uh, access to the platforms themselves. Um, there's an automated pipeline user which will actually run the primary analysis. No human user will ever deliberately, uh, deliberately log into these machines. And the auditing is mostly going to be done within the LIMS system rather than the, rather than the actual compute nodes. Um, and the user's access will be confined to running the various LIMS reports to find out where their sequencing has got to and finally getting their data out of iRODS. We will be using completely, even more, even more so than we currently do, a completely automated deployment and configuration. The standard repair for a machine will be redeploy it. Don't try to actually go in and fix it. And the idea was also that this design should be something that we can cookie cut. So if a spin-out company or somebody was says, right, I want one of those as well, please, we go, right, yes, certainly, there you go. It's a separate virtual machine zone, yours, done. <laughs> In reality, of course, it all got quite a lot more complicated. And that is a small section of the, of the final design for the GCLP setup. Uh, there were projects that came along that actually decided that they needed even more storage. So you, the actual... The virtual iRODs ended up being smaller, but off to one side here, you can't see it because it's confidential. There's a customer, spin-out company customer that wants the same thing, but uh, we're having to do some of it physical because their capacity needs are higher. But you end up with all of these dozens of other little virtual machines, the, in the install servers, the configuration management servers. Da -da 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 -da. It's become really, uh, and of course, test and dev virtual machines for everything. So it's ended up being quite a, um, <coughs> quite a significant uh, task. 
And one thing that we did, we did, I think we did get right, was we deliberately went to the, we went to the um, scientific, the lab pipeline people and said, we want you to actually sign off on this design because we are not changing it after you. Once you've said yes, because uh, as predictably as happened, they came along and they said, oh yeah, can we do this differently? No, we're three months down building this thing now and documenting it. And it's, you know, it's not changing now. Um, <coughs> so there's been a bit of um, there's been a bit of, cu of culture shock associated with this. The scientists and the bioinformaticians have suddenly discovered that they're not allowed to do things like change the pull down baits for their sequencing on a whim, which they did try to do. And the uh, GCLP guys in the in the sequencing labs went. Uh, no, because we validated the ones you first told us about, and we're not going to just change them suddenly. Um, they, they can't switch to the latest shiny programming tool or bioinformatics tool or whatever it is. Um, obviously, there's a, there's a little asterisk here. You know, if you want to go through, the, the, through rigorous change management and revalidation, of course, you can do it. But the point is that they have to go through that process. Change manage project management applies to everyone. That's something that's really come as a bit of a shock. You know, we, we managed to adopt it within IT quite successfully, I think. But it's suddenly come as a bit of a shock to everybody else that, oh, you mean, you know, I know you had to say that you wanted to change something and tell us. But, oh, I didn't realize we had to tell you when we wanted to change something as well. Um, and that's, that's become a bit, of, that's a bit of a culture shock to everybody. Um, and for us, within the IT department, change management previously had not been something we did at a great, to a great extent. So it's been a bit of a learning experience for us. Doing our formal documentation, both for our, for our designs, for our project management, for standard operating procedures, or in test frameworks, all of this stuff, this is all quite new. But we're, you know, we're embracing it quite successfully, I think. Um, and we're quite keen on the whole DevOps thing. We were doing it anyway, it's just been more formalized. So everything that's conf a configuration is has to be scripted because there's otherwise there's room for mistakes and the entire platform has to be auditable which is another reason why we why we do that okay so what are the challenges and limitations of what we're planning for uh, GCLP um, service at the moment well the first one is reproducibility we haven't yet got a good handle on how we make the software stack reproducible if somebody comes back to us in three years time and says I want you to show me how you got that result and that's where things like docker and linux containers come in because we're thinking of using those as ways of encapsulating a particular workflow we don't bother at all with secondary analysis all we're doing is quick qc and alignment and after that it's the customer's problem what they do with the with the data um, one of our customers does eventually want to do gclp on their secondary analysis um, but we haven't even started thinking about how to do that. The pipelines are way too varied. We've got that multi-tenancy issue because they they all want to use traditional shared storage. Um, we need containerized workloads and virtualized HPCs probably needed in order to make this work. Um, and as people working on pan cancer project are probably well aware, this is not easy and it doesn't work terribly well at the moment. So this is a, not an insignificant challenge. On the sort of legal side, there's an enormous amount of uncertainty, at least in the EU, about what the law actually says. I went to a, um, I went to a, a meeting in Paris beginning of last year about the you know, people talking about putting genomic data in the cloud and so on. And you know, nominally, everybody in Europe is subject to the same data protection directives as everybody else. But the range of interpretation of what that actually meant was enormous from the you know, extremely powerful Teutonic lawyer who said, no, never put anything anywhere near the cloud ever, 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 to others who were going, yeah, just fine, just whatever. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's um, and the usual you know, tinfoil hat stuff as well. So um, there's, there are questions about, well, is the genomic data we've got actually identifiable or not? You know, you, um, Ask any, but any of my scientists, so what data retention policy do you need? How long do you actually need to keep this stuff? And they sort of go, um, I haven't really thought about it, um, which is tricky as well. Um, if we're going to be working with NHS hospitals, yeah, we have the National Health Service. Great. Unfortunately, 
if, a, if an NHS hospital or, or trust is going to give you access to some of its data, you have to make a separate legal arrangement with each trust that you need to exchange data with. We don't have a clue how we're going to manage that problem. It is not a, nominally it's a single NHS, not really. And that's just the problems in Europe. You know, with things like pan cancer and all of these other collaborative projects, we, you know, we've also got to have that problem on the, on the massive scale of international agreements as well. So I, this is really, I, that's, I have no idea where we're going to do that. And one thing that we've found very difficult is that, to some extent, IT have been left to decide on the security policies and data management policies on our own. Um, and that's re we're not the people who should be making that decision. That's definitely the business's decision. You know, I can do whatever they ask me to do, but I shouldn't be making that up. So that's, that's a slightly tricky one. Um, but we've actually we've started working to, to improve that. We've, we've actually hired a dedicated security officer whose job it is to manage that stuff now. So eMed Lab. So this is a collaboration. This was uh, the brainchild of my former boss, um, uh, Phil Butcher, who many of you will know, he was really keen on this idea. The idea was that somewhere we would build a, a shared data center where we each had some private space um, and there would be some sort of secure collaborative space where we could exchange data, analyze each other's data, da 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 da, all that good stuff. Um, and that's why you've got the people here who were particularly, you know, the Crick Institute, Phil used to be the director of, of IT there as well as at Sanger. So this is originally one of his diagrams. But in fact, this has become a um, this has sort of become a steady beginning to become a reality. So last year, the Medical Research Council put out a call for um, bids for collaborative bioinformatics infrastructure, and EMED Lab was one such proposal, which won. So it's a collaboration between all of these organisations. So we've got the Francis Crick Institute, University College London, the EBI, us, uh, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, Queen Mary University. And it's potentially expandable to anybody else who wants to join it. And what are the things it's going to be doing? So it's hosted at that same shared data center in Slough that we're putting our IROD stuff in, which is a nice coincidence. Well, it's not a coincidence, it's deliberate. Um, the data center was selected to meet um, impact level three and various NHS security requirements. So if we are host, going to need to host clinical data, that's already certified, it's fine. Um, it will have connectivity both to the Joint Academic Network and to the NHS N3 network. Um, it's a reasonable size bit of compute resource, 6,000 cores, around 5 petabytes of storage. And it's the key thing is this is the, our sort of real first attempt at fully virtualized HPC, um, which is going to be on OpenStack. Uh, it's a pretty aggressive timeline. The kit hasn't actually arrived yet. It's going to arrive next month but they want to begin operations sometime in Q2 2015. It's pretty aggressive. And there will be a pilot project in 2015 with the FAR Institute. These guys who are a, uh, another collaborative institute, they, they specifically work around federated access to clinical data sets, and that's their whole be all and end all. And, so, and, that's, and here comes that Janet Moonshot thing I, recommend, I, rec I spoke about earlier. That's, that authorization piece is going to use that. And that's pretty much uh, an overview of the sort of things that we're doing at the moment. Uh, just, I should just uh, do the credits for the people that, uh, that I work with. Um, so Paul Wooby, who is our new um, IT director, um, who's previously worked at Pfizer, the Office for National Statistics, and General Electric. Um, there's me. Uh, many of you will know Guy Coates, who's the head, who heads up our high performance computing uh, group. Um, and I within his group, Peter Clapham, who's our real iRODs expert, but has also been instrumental in the work on, on Lustre, and he's also one of he's Sanger's current um, sort of dedicated person for designing the EMAD Lab services. Uh, James Beale, who's been working on object storage and Lustre stuff. John Constable, who's also been heavily involved in object storage. Helen, who works on, uh, who's been working on Lustre and doing an enormous amount of the GCLP work together with Simon Fraser, and John Nicholson, who does our network and holds everything together, and then these various other members of, of the IT team, Mark and Shanti, who work for, they don't work for me, but they work for other parts of the IT organization that support us. And of course, there's vast numbers of 
bioinformaticians who help us as well and, and, and give us nice thorny problems to deal with. Um, and of course the staff at DDN and Intel who've been sorting us out with various issues we've had. And I think that's about all I've got to say. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Thank you.